good afternoon. I want to start with a quote, a shameless illustration, and a challenge. The quote is this. I remember years ago, I walked in the back of a cafeteria where a number of teachers were assembled, getting ready for someone to make a presentation. And as I started to move my way up towards the front, I heard one teacher lean over to another teacher and say, I hope that when I die, I'm at an in-service because the transition will be so subtle. <laughs> so my first thing is to make sure that you stay awake. My second is this. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that you're a teacher today and that you want to teach a unit because it'll really foster creativity. So you begin to do that, and the kids really like it, but you're hesitant about adding more days to that unit. Still, you think you should. Why do you hesitate? Because you've got content to cover. And why is that content so important? Because there's a test that's going to measure it. And why is that so important? Because your evaluation is in part determined by how kids do on that. And this is exactly how I think a lot of our best teachers feel today. Now the question becomes, does this choke you? What are you going to do? What can you do? You need to break through that. And here is the challenge when we break through it. One is we need to make, when you think about education, we need to make it about learning, not tests. We need to make it about improvement, not judgment. And we need to make it about relevance, not limits. Now, several years ago, Todd Rose at an event similar to this, spoke about a problem the Air Force was having in the early uh, 50s. They had a problem with jet fighter pilots. Their performance wasn't very good, so they weren't sure what to do. So at first they thought, it's the pilots. That's the problem. We need better pilots. And then after a while, no, it's not the pilots. It's the technology. No, it's not the technology. It must be the training program. We've got to improve the training program. Well, after looking at several hypotheses, they came up with this, and they were accurate. They said the problem was the cockpit. The pilot's ability to interface with that cockpit flawlessly. You see, they had developed that cockpit based upon the average measurements of all pilots. What was the average arm length? What was the average torso? What was the average 10 different dimensions? And then they designed it around that. Now, seeing this didn't work, they went out and they actually measured now the average pilot. You know how many average pilots they had? They had none. That's why it didn't work. <laughs> so when you design to average, you design to no one. So in fairness, the Air Force goes back to the manufacturer and says, we've got to design to edges. Oh, no, we can't do that. Yeah, you have to do it or it's not going to work. So they went back and they began working on it. And what at the time was revolutionary is not at all today. When you get in your car, you can move it forwards or backwards up or down, one modification that came from that discussion. We need to think about designing to the edges. There are no average kids. It's not about designing to average. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, at the little high school I graduated from in southeastern Ohio uh, several decades ago. I know it's hard to believe given my youthful parents, but... Uh, Still, several decades ago, my teachers didn't say this, but here's what really happened. They taught the best and hoped for the rest. You were either going to college or you were going to the coal mines or the steel mills, or the aluminum plants of where I worked in the summer, but that's what happened. And they could make a great middle class living from that. Then in the 1970s, we built vocational schools for various careers across Ohio and across this country. And then we taught the best and we transported the rest. Now we've reached an interesting stage today where we need to teach the rest as if they were the best. The truth of it is today in many of our vocations, advanced manufacturing, a host of others, there's more math required there than there is in a number of college majors unless you're going to major in mathematics or engineering. There are no average kids. Kids may represent 20% of any given community's population, but they represent 100% of the future. And how are we going to help each one? 
when they walk across this symbolic stage to be prepared for something and more than hope, what are the things that we need to do to particularly help them? Now, I think there are three things that we need to decrease the emphasis on, and I think there are three things we need to ratchet up. Now, let's start with the three that we need to, in my opinion, to decrease. Scores. We need to decrease scores. We need to decrease our emphasis on schools and structures. Let's start with scores. Now, there's a large university in the middle of Columbus that I attended a long time ago that I'm not sure I could get in now based on my ACT score, candidly. In fact, I'm almost sure I couldn't. Now, it's interesting because SAT, ACT scores do not predict adult success. You know that. They don't even predict college success, but they are great sorting devices, and we use them. And I watch some kids who allow themselves to be defined by it. They've pictured where they are on that bell curve, and it stays with them forever, and it's nonsense. Now, we do it as a country. People will say to me, have you seen the latest comparison on the international math and science test? The United States is in the middle of the pack. It's absolutely true. But then I add, do you know they started that in the 1960s? And ever since the U.S. started, we've been in the middle of the pack. But yet as a country of the last 65 years, we have watched the greatest economic expansion the world has ever seen. So when I think about scores, I think we've done pretty well in terms of creativity and innovation. Here's some scores maybe, and I realize you probably can't see them, but they're from a book by Tony Wagner. It's a reminder that when it comes to patents and innovative companies and Nobel Prizes, nobody is near our score in that. If we limit ourselves strictly to academic outcomes, in my view, it's like climbing the ladder of success to realize, too late, the ladder was on the wrong wall. There are other pieces to it. So scores is one. Now, second is schools. Now, I don't really want to get rid of schools, uh, but I want to look at them differently. It's not to get rid of brick and mortar, but I want you to think about this idea. School, not as a place but as what is taking place. Today, we can bring so many resources within that school. I see all kinds of examples. Does anybody really believe that kids aren't learning outside that day? The average college kid has seven devices. I don't know about high school. And they're all using them at once sometimes. But learning is continuous, so we begin to think about how can we harness that inside. I, I couldn't get my garage door to work the other day, and I, I, I did what most adults are now doing, the number one learning device. I went to YouTube, found it, did exactly what it said, boom, it worked. Uh, I talked to a young man who I said, what class are you taking that's your heart? I said, it's accounting. Now, he's taking accounting at a local university. I said, he said, well, I'm taking accounting there, but I'm learning it from a professor at Stanford who has 100,000 students on Udacity. I talked to high school kids who are using the Khan Academy to learn things. You get the idea? School is not a place. It's what's taking place. I thought about this the other day. I've only learned how to use Uber in about the last eight or nine months, and I travel a lot, so I've begun using Uber. And it's interesting when I think about Uber because here is arguably the largest, most valuable transportation company in the world, and they don't own a cab. Airbnb, if you've used it, is arguably the most valuable lodging company, and they don't own a hotel. Quicken Mortgages is yet another. They are arguably, they're the third largest mortgage lender, and they don't own a bank. And my favorite, of course, is Amazon. They are the largest retailer in the world, and they don't own, except one that's coming, store. Think about delivery of educational services someday. It's not that it will be completely privatized in any way, but we begin to think about schools differently and how we can utilize them and not in the same traditional way, one that is far more geared to opportunities for our kids. So we need to think about schools differently. Here's one other one very quickly that Tony and them, and I, I embrace this, the idea that content knowledge is it's a commodity. 
Any subject you want in the world, you can get. We can find that. The second part is what kids need. And these kids I have watched firsthand over the last few weeks do this. Critical thinking, communication. I'm not going to read those C's, but you know how important they are. Now, you do need knowledge. Otherwise, we're going to sit in groups and share ignorance. So at the end of the day, there is a room for knowledge. This isn't to discard all knowledge. There are things you need to know. And the last part is motivation. That, I think that's the most important of all. I remember years ago walking in our high school, and the English teacher just steps outside her classroom, slammed her door, looked at me, and said, these kids just aren't motivated. Now it was 2.28 in the afternoon. I said, I don't know what happened. I know you've had a bad day or a bad last class period, but I want to tell you something. Two minutes when this bell rings, I want you to watch the kids go to the parking lot, and I want you to tell me they're not motivated. <laughs> it is the antecedent. It is to what? Why wouldn't we find out what kids are interested in, what their passions are, not to direct them to a job, but to a pathway to clusters of opportunities. What a shame if we don't do that. What a disservice. It isn't about causing somebody to be something, but it's helping them to figure out. The question is not whether or not kids are smart. The question is how are they smart? And then the last thing is to get rid of structures or to begin to decrease it. Think about it. I mentioned it's schools, it's not just what happens at 7.30 in the morning till 2.30. We don't quit then. Uh, how about my favorite? We start in early September and we quit in May because learning can only occur between those. Or at many high schools, well, no, it can only occur if we have five 50-minute blocks of time. Or my personal favorite, we need to put kids who are chronologically aged together and we move them forward in groups for the next decade of their lives all those things. You see those. And I'm not saying to disband them, but I'm saying we need to suspend our beliefs about those. So those are three things I think we need to decrease. Scores and schools and structures. Here's three things I think we need to really embrace. First is personalization. Really getting to know kids. And I'm not just talking about academically. Look, I think Jiffy Lube knows more about my car than some people know about kids. Now, in fairness, teachers say, wait a minute, I got 30 kids class period for five class periods, I can't. It's true, and unless we break some of these structures, you don't. But why wouldn't we wanna know? For example, there's a website called Thrively where kids can go on there, take an assessment, and you see what your strengths are. Those are really talents. They only become strengths when you begin to use them. But why not early? We begin to figure out what are kids what do they have talents for? How can we direct that? How can we do that? We customize everything else. Why wouldn't we want to really know kids? I asked a Harvard researcher who is responsible for the largest teacher effectiveness study ever done in this country. I said, is this how you pick your kid's teacher? Do you look, because I knew he had middle schoolers. I said, do you look at who they're going to have and see how kids scored on tests? And he kind of smiled and said, no, I said, what do you do? How do you know if your kids have a good teacher? He said, honestly, I said, yeah. He said, well, he said, if they know my boys like to fly fish, they're a good teacher. I said, why do you say that? He said, because my boys are very quiet. And for you to know they like to fly fish, you had to dig down and actually listen to them like Claire talked about. You had to know them. And he said, if my kids know you know they like fly fishing, he said, they will do anything for you. So personalization in this world, all those things we can do to really personalize education. The second P is participation. I'm talking about real authentic engagement. There's an old uh, proverb that goes, what I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. What I do, I understand. It is about application. Uh, I watched a group of kids not long ago, high school kids who, as part of a technology demonstration, a doctor came into their classrooms literally via screen and did an autopsy. And the kids went through as he explained what he was doing, what might be the hypothesis for what he was thinking about the cause of death there. And went through several things, and those kids were highly engaged in putting together a whole host of things that they had at their disposal with both skills and knowledge to do that. They were engaged. Do kids work harder around something they like, are interested in, and is, 
relevant? Yeah, that's a duh. You know that's true. So at the end of the day, we've got to increase that whole participation, Pete, to make it authentic. I have to tell you, watching this group of young people here over the last few weeks put this entire thing together, you talk about real and putting together teams and all those other things. It was incredible to me now as I've watched it. I'm a little humbled at the first meeting when I'm sitting there and each person's going around and said, I'm a senior and I'm doing this, I'm a senior and I'm doing this. And then it came to me and I said, I'm a senior, citizen. <laughs> but I've been humbled by watching them. They're terrific. The last P is why not have a playlist? My daughter helped me put together a playlist that has songs on it that I like. Why wouldn't we think about that as a metaphor for learning for kids? And that you have a playlist. These are the things that you're going to need. So those are the P's that I think we need to up. We need to up personalization, real participation in playlists. Years ago, for a number of years in the 80s and 90s, I was superintendent of East Muskingum School. It's about 70 miles east of here. John Glenn High School was named after Senator Glenn in 1962 when he orbited the earth. And he came back many times to talk to kids. And one of the times he came back, uh, an assistant and I saved what we thought was the greatest quote ever. And then I have to fast forward. In 1998, you'll recall when Senator Glenn went back up into space again as a senior citizen. And he broadcast to kids. But when he came back, the person who was superintendent did something I loved. She had someone Photoshop or create a poster that showed the front of John Glenn High School. And in the back was the space shuttle being launched. And underneath it was that quote that we had heard Senator Glenn tell kids many years before. If you get your start here, you can go anywhere. That ought to be our aspiration and vision for every kid wherever they go. If you get your start here, you can go anywhere. And for kids, it's about finding out what are your passions and asking people to help you. And for teachers and administrators, sometimes it's suspending some of those barriers to say, I am going to do right by kids. And for parents, it's about insisting that someone's going to help my kid and kids figure out their passions, and I'm going to support you when you decide to do something that's different than what I had. We are all planting shade trees for shade we won't enjoy. At least the people in my age are. And the best thing we can do is to leave it better than we found it. And the world is dramatically changing. And I'll finish with one other one. I've been to China about a dozen times. And one of the times there, I took bookmarks and passed them out to a group of kindergartners. And this little kindergarten girl looked at me and she said, would you like a bookmark to take back? I said, yeah, that'd be great. She looked at me and said, you want an English or Chinese? And then I was struck by, of course, the, English, the largest English-speaking country uh, isn't China, but it will be. It's India. Certainly not us. But the world has shrunk. And we are preparing kids for a world that is so much different. But I can tell you, spending the last couple of weeks of doing things with this incredible group of kids... We are in safe hands, but it is our job to help direct and encourage and to play out that mantra. If you get your start here, you can go anywhere. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat>